start the recording and reading the text. So welcome everyone for the fourth week already of the online seminar of the Museum Without Walls uh, conference exhibition project. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you all here. Museum Without Walls is an ongoing exploration of virtual art institutions and communities currently supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Queen's University, Screen Cultures and Curatorial Studies Program, and the Agnes Eternton Art Center. For this stage of the project, Museum Without Walls has been physically hosted at Queen's University in Ontario. It's worth remembering that, just like many museums across the world, Queen's University is situated on unceded land, ancestral home of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And in this third uh, encounter, we'll be talking about sites of exhibition. And in that case, it will be mostly virtual sites of exhibition and how media has also become a sort of container for artworks and historical objects. And with us today, we have, uh, well, five presenters. Sadly, one of our presenters for the day couldn't come, but we'll be discussing her work with her present next week, Rosalind Bond. Here with us, we have Laura Cocciolino, Cocciolillo, sorry, who graduated in 2019 in contemporary art at La Sapienza University, Rome, with a dissertation on curatorial practices for net art in the 21st century. She's currently attending a master's degree course in contemporary art at Kafoskari University in Venice. And her current and re her research is mainly focused on the relationship between art and new technologies in particular on digital culture and aesthetics of new media. And she has among her publications, Net Art and Hacktivism, The Artivism in the Network from the 90s to today, The Self and the Other, The Body, Empathy and Relationship with Otherness in Virtual Reality, and Second Life, First Steps into the Virtual Scape in Visual Arts. We also have with us Larissa Pereira and Karini Berger Mieterschik, Schick, yes, hope so. Who uh, are Mich visual artists? Could you please repeat? Mirching. Mirching, thank you. Uh, who are visual artists and master students at the Federal University of Espírito Santo in Brazil? Their research activities are advised by Daniel Ora, who is an uh, associate professor at the same program and one of the leaders of the research group Fe Fresta, Technical Images and Wandering Devices. And finally, we have Sojung Ban an award-winning multidisciplinary artist, filmmaker, and researcher. She was appointed as an assistant professor in media and performance production at Queen's University beginning in July this year. So Jung explores cinematic media via digital technologies to reflect aesthetic and narrative experiences in cultural and philosophical contexts. She holds a PhD from Sense Lab at Monash University in Australia, and her doctoral thesis cinematic VR as a reflexive tool beyond empathy was awarded the 2020 Molly Holman Award for the best thesis of the year. So once again, welcome to all presenters and well, everyone in the audience. As I mentioned the other times, this can be kind of a interesting multi-sided interview or it can be more of a, of a free-flowing horizontal conversation. For starters, I'd have some general comments and questions for each of the of the talks. And I guess that perhaps today, uh, since we are kind of all in the same, under the same topic, more or less, which is again, virtual exhibitions. The, the odd one out was Rosalind, who would be talking about Instagram museums. It's another way to reconceptualize the image as a site of exhibition or how exhibition sites can start to be designed to be reproduced as images. But all the three works that we'll be discussing here today are very more, very no, are more literally about virtual exhibition spaces. And once again, I'll kind of follow the order of, of presentations and start with some general questions. As usual, if anyone in the audience or if any of the presenters want to post anything to the chat or start preparing questions, that's that's what we're here for. So anyway, uh, we'll start with Laura and her presentation galleries in simulated environments, the case of Ars Virtua, which was one of the first uh, art galleries in Second Life. And what I found 
and I didn't realize that the project that you presented, they were part of this gallery. I think that I, I got hold of them at the time, especially the Evan Frank Tomatoes one. Uh, and it's strange how digital art history becomes so, like exhibition art histories ex uh, are not that, uh, we don't keep track of exhibitions and we keep even less track of digital exhibitions perhaps. But one similar similarity between them is that both of them in a way were trying to reach to a certain truth beyond the virtual world or may, at least uh, calling it into question. Like one was about avatars, the most beautiful avatars and it, it makes you wonder the people behind these avatars and the other one was about honesty. And once again, you have this question of truth being kind of foregrounded by exhibition projects. And I, I, I wondered if that was something, I don't know if, if you've come across with other examples of that in your research, Laura, uh, how much this theme or how much this, the ghost of the real, so to say, or this kind of the dichotomical relation between virtual and real were, was present in the exhibitions at the time, in the virtual or digital exhibitions at the time. And how do you feel it's being represented in virtual exhibitions these days that you are aware of? Yes. So uh, thanks for the interesting question, Gabriel. Well, yes, you, you're right. I mean, the, um, my aim was to show, you know, the double sided mechanism and then that links the virtual and the real as as you mentioned it happens for 13 most beautiful avatars uh, in which you know um, the virtual overflow the physical world even causing remediation of virtual exhibition in the real world and that was what interested me because uh, you know uh, too often in the present like in the last few years we saw you know uh, uh, you know, uh, try as uh, many people trying to, uh, you know, an attempt to uh, translate the the physical existing exhibition in the virtual for, for example, for you know necessity. <laughs> um, but you know, with Evan Franco Mattes, uh, but also in David Cretford's stop motion studies, even if maybe for Evan Franco it's more even more clear. Um, you know, they wanted to generate in the viewer the sense of ambiguity, blurring the boundaries, you know, between the real and the virtual. And, you know, the, I believe that the entire point of contemporaneity could be just, you know, that and every boundary is blurring. And so, you know, as reality is the other side of kind of virtuality. At the same time, I wanted to, you know, look at the past, of, of, at, at the previous experiences, making a sort of, you know, um, ar archaeology of, um, of, yes, virtual exhibition, uh, because at the same time, you know, uh, I believe that past is an, an indispensable condition to, you know, understand the present and, yeah, uh, another another point is the reflection on identity, because uh, the key concept of identity was for me a red thread through all the presentation, because you know on one end we have thirteen most beautiful avatars, um, in which you know the exhibition plays with the ego related factor that links uh, the traditional self portrait portrait on one end and on the other hand the creation of the avatar uh, and it is a it, it is I believe that it's about how we perceive ourselves in the virtual world and how you know the virtual world perceive us and on the other hand we have like, uh, honesty our, uh, is our policy uh, that is about how we fake identities online and I believe that here the key point is that in order to make it work I mean in order to make online interaction in the context of second life uh, we have no chance but you know um, blindly accept that version of the self that the other is giving us is presenting and at the same time we're doing the same because uh we're using customized 
uh, images of ourselves. Um, and so I think it's interesting how, uh, you know, uh, the hover is able to be at the same time a mask and an identity. Um, so I, I hope I answered to your question. Um, in relation to what happens nowadays, uh, and, and not almost 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, I believe that, um, I mean, many, uh, I mean, we have maybe, uh, but it's just my opinion, maybe we have less uh, awareness on this, um, on this medium, even if we've been no interactive interacting with it for a long time but in the 90s and at the beginning of the 21st century it was mm, different because we have those uh, ambitions and this and this and this fear you know this um ambiguous uh you know emotion towards the what was happening with the internet now is i think it's going mainstream and we're using this for you know, mainstream interaction or maybe superficial arrangements. <laughs> and I don't know, that's it. Oh, oops. No, no, oops. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, It's interesting to put this in terms of ambitions and fears because it feels to me that Silicon Valley is extremely ambitious this day, or at least it, it propagates a very ambitious vision for the future. But our fears are certainly different, and especially our awareness of technology. And since we have time before moving into, to, into other questions to other presenters, uh, Sojung, you raise your hand if you have any comments specifically yeah. about yes. this. Yeah, just a little bit of like clarification or a little bit more question on that. I really enjoyed it, that presentation, and, but I was kind of curious because I could sort of compare that Postman and Rosalind's presentation about, you know, like sort of self representation and self identity could be like, because Laura's presentation is kind of talking about another version of reality and identity in 2006. And Hosman's like presentation is focused on very recent version of Instagram sort of identity. Because I mean, I, I don't remember in 2006, I used smartphone or not, maybe it was kind of smart when we just started, but now we just always, everyone uses smartphone. So like, is there like particular reason you just picked that sort of very early age sort of examples and how those kind of uh, another version of realities, another version of self-representation -rep identity sort of change the grew like uh, when or while the technologies evolve or develop. So like, do you have any idea on that? Yes, yes, that's interesting because yes, my my aim, one of my you know, uh, first aim, my first aim was to uh, to highlight how these virtual words and technique for building exhibition in virtual in my environments used to be a thing since the last two decades, and you know even if. For example, the metaverse has increased its popularity after, obviously, the pandemic, and especially uh, after you know uh, Mark Zuckerberg and and all. And uh, but I, I believe that we should keep in mind that many uh, early experiences in 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 virtual world uh, originated at the beginning of the twenty first century, and they were. Uh, they were here uh, full of, you know, as I said, ambition, expectation, and also anxiety and fears toward, uh, yes, the technological progress. And I wanted to, you know, to create a link uh, with the past, a confrontation with the past, because I, I believe that it's it's important to to remember uh, that th this was something already 20 years ago. And when we, you know, when we have all this hype for what's happening, like, um, so recently, uh, I think that knowing what happens in the past and avoid to forget uh, 
what we had before it helps us to you know uh resize <laughs> the, the the ambition not the ambition but the you know the faith that we have somehow and but you had a second part of the question and uh, could you repeat that I think your lady answer about just sort of change of roles of like the self representations, like as technology grows. I think you kind of like answered this question, right? And then... Okay, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll pass on to Karine, but uh, while doing so, I'll already uh, state my question to the second set of presenters. And I think it relates to this idea of knowing the past in order to I mean better understand the future because I still remember the hype around second life and I still I, Brazilian banks created second life islands I mean and we have a similar hype nowadays or a partial hype around notions of metaverse and promises of metaverse so maybe this would be like a broader framework to try to understand how you folks relate to the notion of metaverse in your research. But the second part of the question, or maybe a second question is more uh, specific about the case studies that you have, because you compare different exhibitions using different platforms. And I wanted to know if you can differentiate between the exhibition design and the affordances or the possibilities of these platforms. So do you feel that some of the things that you identified in the exhibitions were curatorial decisions while others were defined by the platforms or do you feel that there is a sort of synergy there or a or a sort of tension um, and yeah how do you feel about that um well um yes i believe that uh my case studies are strictly strictly um, linked to uh, the medium and way when <laughs> and when they uh, uh, you know for example when they in the case for example of Ivan Franco Matas when they overflow in the real in the real world uh, I believe that um, the, the, their power is to talk about themselves while performing themselves right so uh, it's not just a matter of medium they 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 are linked to it to it but at the same time mm, they use the medium to talk about themselves in a certain sense they, they are tautological exhibition right so um for example as i said in uh uh, yes, in 13 Most Beautiful Avatars, the fact was that, uh, for example, when they uh, came came out, you know, in the uh, in the physical space, uh, at the at that point, the, the avatar is most almost brings to life, right? So uh, it, it came it came it came out to you know it, it overflow in, in the half world. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> no, sorry, I should have been more clear because, yeah, maybe the question doesn't make that sense to you, but I was specifically thinking about Daniel, Larissa, and Karine's work, where oh. they compare <laughs> different exhibitions that use different platforms. Uh, oh, and okay, I mean, okay. the case of Ars Virtua is not so clear because it's all, all using Ars Virtua on Second Life. So, uh, no, yes, anyway, yes, I was. Oh, uh, no, I just thought that you were referring to, you know, the 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 physical space of the gallery. But yeah, okay. So I took too much space. Sorry. No worries, not no problem. But anyway, Daniel, Larissa, and Karin, it was more specifically for you. I'm sorry that I wasn't clear because I know that you address the different platforms and different exhibitions in these platforms. So, uh, did you find anything about the differences? specific to the platforms or to the exhibitions? Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you, Gabriel, for holding this meeting. And uh, uh, congratulations for uh, Sol Jung and, and Laura. And your works are, are very inspiring and insightful uh, as well. And um, 
maybe we we could um, uh, compare those uh, different platforms. Uh, but um, I, I think in in a way we have um, a kind of well, a more um, metaverse uh, think with um, social interaction uh, in a game like Occupy White Walls and um, a more explorative uh, uh, spatial design with uh, the wrong pavilions. Maybe this, this is the, the, the first point we could highlight. Uh, another um, aspect of, of this um, is, is very interesting because uh, in, in a virtual environment, we could uh, explore and invent, uh, try to um, uh, be free, like uh, in a surrealistic space without gravity and so on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's uh, it really um, striking when we see the white code is still there. In, in some sense, the, the white code is still uh, a, a model, uh, uh, a paradigm for exhibitions. And so uh, the, the, the difference, uh, there, there are differences, but uh, maybe they uh, um, could be reunited with the same part, this paradigm of a white code. So, uh, but I would like to, to pass to Larissa and Karine to say hello to the audience also. And Miro Suarez is the other leader of our group here. And we have also uh, Alexana. Uh, she's uh, my advisor here as well. So, Larissa or, or Karine, maybe Karine, she is already with uh, her hand raised. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Uh, we have a question for Laura. We discussed it uh, about the other presentations. And as a group, we would like to know about the word unframingness. You used it referring to the virtual spaces of exhibition. Could you talk more about it? Uh, do you think we should consider technology as a new kind of framing structure? Or could we relate it to conceptualism? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, this is um, uh, a term that I borrowed from aesthetic, actually. And um, it refers to what happened I mean, any every uh, representation, uh, as for example, literally uh, a painting, has a uh, you know a frame, and uh, um, and yes, uh, it, the term doesn't refer to to technology. Uh, I mean, does not strictly refer to it, but um, I think it's important to use this when um, when. Immersive technologies, uh, you know, allow, uh, allow us to uh, to enter the picture that becomes the uh, an environmental image, and so I imagine this double-sided mechanism of the 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 image overflowing its you know its frame, and you know. Uh, we are able to enter the picture through our avatars or in virtual reality, uh, literally wearing the frame. I mean, the frame is the, um, uh, the border of representation, actually. So unframingness um, is, uh, you know, it's what happens when, uh, you know, the, 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 the image, is able to overflow and uh, overflow the, the the frame and become an environmental image. So I think that it's uh, especially important for new technologies and and, uh, and um, uh, yes, the uh, environmental and immersive technologies. In this sense, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you, uh, Danielle and Larissa. Do you have any other questions for her? 
or, or maybe if you want to highlight some aspects of the platforms you are studying, especially um, like coming back to the question of Gabriel about, okay, Larissa, can you talk a little bit? If I may, like perhaps develop the question, uh, have you used the platforms yeah. to create exhibitions as well? And if you did, what, uh, how, how, how did you find them? Like, what was the best to use? What was the yeah. most interesting? This, thing, uh, this is uh, one part of our uh, research. Like we, we have these projects in progress right now. And uh, in, in some months, I hope so, Larissa and Karine, they are going to to organize something there, like creating an exhibition. So, so. Okay, so can I try to answer a little bit of the question? So Gabriel asked before, uh, by the way, thank you for the question <laughs> and hi everyone. So he asked about the differences between the platforms and uh, how the assets provided by the developers of the game like um, um, interfere in the way the users uh, create the space like there are some limitations for the the, the space in occupy white walls because the users have to use the assets provided by the developers but there are more than 2,300 assets in the game right now so far and the game is in constant update so there's always a new update and before there's history of um, old players that were trying to find out bugs about the game and they were using these bugs to break the game code and build different things that weren't allowed by the platform before but then with the new updates uh they they made uh these bugs a feature of the game so there is a, a very um i'm not gonna say teamwork but the community is very fond of the game and they are always trying to discover different things within the game and they are always in touch with the developers uh, via the Discord platform. So they uh, keep in touch. And the creation, the creation space of the game, um, that there's too many space in the game for creating galleries, actually. <laughs> it's too big and it, it's a hard job to go and, and say like, I want to do um, creation of the Occupy White Walls. It's really hard because there are thousands of galleries, so you lose control because it's too many assets. But uh, you can uh, build your own gallery or your own uh, collab gallery. You can build a gallery with other players. And uh, this social aspect is one of the biggest difference that we have to compare with the other platforms, like the wrong platform has just one exhibition with the social side that the visitors can leave comments uh, in a web page, but it's still not a, something like a chat. And in the other example of the, the wrong, which is the non game, right? Uh, we don't have this social feature. Map, I think, yeah. Yeah. So yes, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question properly, but. <laughs> you did, yeah. On that note, uh, sorry, Rene, before we pass on to your question comment, I just wanted to bring Sojourn in the conversation because I guess this, this question about comparing platforms and also framing has a lot to do with her project and how she devised or she uses three different forms of immersive imaging to present her work. And I was wondering if she could also comment a little bit on the differences and how each form, like between cinematic VR and 360 video and well, whatever yeah. kinds of installation beyond it you use, uh, how this affects the work that you develop and the audience reception. 
Yes. It was really actually, it was really interesting to see all of your presentation because I'm the only person actually develop the platform. And so because I'm a practice-based mm -hmm. researcher and then you guys more of an anal analyze the 2006 and also current version of the platform. So yeah, so also I just really want to kind of um, hear you guys comments about my you know exhibition as well. In terms of like development, I only have a four thousand dollar, like Australian dollar is kind of Canadian dollar, so like I couldn't develop for like social interactions. I couldn't really develop for VR versions, but still, it was really interesting to see how the kind of like the virtual gallery setup changed my experience. For example, like I I supposed to kind of create a watchtower. But like in the rear gallery spaces, I could just create a watchtower, like like a you know just using some cardboard, whatever. But in the virtual gallery, I can create a cave. I could create a like huge watchtower and maybe the redder or something. So, uh, in terms of sense of space, it changed a lot of sort of potential. But um, but still, like because I really want to see if it could be implemented uh, inside of the VR, like the VR in the VR, but like it was so limited because it is still screen-based. So everyone just, you know, look at the oldest 360 degree video. So it's lose a lot of embodied interaction, embodied engagement. So yeah, so it's like, it, there are a lot of sort of potential opportunity, a lot of infrastructure limitation and technical limitation and budgets matter. So I think that's, that's was the things, but also I want to ask you guys back the questions. Like um, I also, tr I'm gonna like keep going this kind of research, uh, embracing a lot of social interaction sort of elements, but also we are in VR, we are in VR and try to kind of create uh, some general languages for the exhibitions and performance that sort of map the various space. So I wonder like how much social interaction aspects would be very important when we exhibit or when we perform things in the virtual, virtual environment, because even when we are in the gallery space, we don't really interact with people, to be honest. We don't really talk. Yeah, so, and even if, even if there are some functions, when I experience Metaverse Museum or something, if there are any social interaction function, we, the avatar there and coming to me, like, I just don't like to talk to them. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. So do we kind of have a too much of an obsession about like functions or feature of social interaction in the Metaverse sort of like virtual reality sort of thing? I just kind of don't get it because it's not a game. We don't really have an aim to win or you know communicate. It's not like Second Life. We are actually communicating with that you know artwork. So that social interaction feature could bother <laughs> experiencing the work. And that that is my one first question. And the second question is: Do we might have built a general language, sort of like kind of general platform? Like if you have to build it, of course, uh, even a curator strategy, uh, we don't really have a unified language, but still we have a, some sort of grammars. But I wonder if we can build that sort of common or general grammars for the virtual museum, or we have to approach all differently. Yeah, so that's the thing. This is my question. It could be my answer. Yeah, thank you. But anyway, it was really, really interesting like presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Super broad and interesting questions, and I think that they could apply to to everyone. But I saw that Larissa has her hand, and Renee was nodding while having his hand up. So if any of you want to start, yeah. So I um I I do I I think so. You nailed something, and I think we. I don't know how many of you are actually like working in exhibitions on a constant uh like constantly uh, with the New Media Caucus, we're virtual and we're constantly trying to generate new different exhibitions using VR, AR, all these things. And um, one of the things that I, I think gets lost is development time. So if I have a VR experience, unless I'm using only stock assets to 
generate my space. And never mind the artist's uh, objects, but like the space, uh, like I want a plant, I want something. Either I use stock objects that are very low quality that cause problems in terms of uh, processing issues, or I generate assets. If I want to generate assets, that's going to be cost. And that's one of the biggest uh, things that stop us. Then there's also the development tools that you're using. So, um, and I, 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 I'm afraid I might offend someone, but Second Life is gone. Like Second Life is in the past. It hasn't been used uh, widely for a while. It's still alive, but it's not really something that's popular. It's not something that people use. And putting an exhibition in there is a, a huge barrier to entry because first of all, you have to install the thing. You have to install um, Second Life. Then you have to learn how to navigate in Second Life. And not only that, but the, the thing is we as like, if you're a gamer or someone that's very infused into virtual spaces like okay WASD and mouse is very familiar but most people struggle with it uh, so you can't expect someone that's not experienced in this to to be able to engage with it in the same way as we do then they have to find the space and then they have to learn to navigate the whole social aspect of, so, of second life which is in itself a minefield of furries and all these other things so using Second Life is very problematic in so many ways. And that's why people are shifting over to things like Mozilla Hubs, for example, if you want to be in a virtual space that's pre-rendered. But in general, like one of the best, like the most commonly used tools is Unity and Unreal Engine. If you look at um, the exhibition for Radiohead or Kid Amnesia, that was generated in Unreal Engine and the, 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 pi the production pipeline and the efficiency of Unreal Engine is absolutely higher and better than anything you can run on um, Second Life. Second Life in my computer that runs Unreal Engine games from today struggles with it because it's not optimized, because it's not done. Now, that's if you want to develop on a software base, like something like Unreal Engine, but you can also develop for WebGL. And WebGL cuts so many of the issues because then you have in-browser experiences. So what that means is that you, your, your user just clicks on a link, it's in the exhibition. They don't have to download anything. They don't have to install anything. They don't have to navigate with any of the things. And I think, well, well examining things that were done in Second Life is very, very useful. We have to start thinking of how, how we develop and how we implement because just generating software is going to take so much of your uh, time, way much more than it takes to develop a, a traditional exhibition because you have to beta test, you have to check your interaction. And then if you want to layer on top of that social interactions, you don't only need, need to deal with chat, you need to deal with moderation. And that's the biggest issue because you know what happens in, in video game chat rooms, you know what happens in social spaces you're going to get white supremacism you're going to get people that do what, what what's called hate raids where a bunch of people just flood into your server to try and you know take it down or insult everyone or get it canceled which is one of the things i was talking about in my in my own talk last last week which is corporate prudishness is going to get in and then you're going to get what your your experience censored so i think that's what I wanted to add to this conversation, all these like little warnings of developing things. And that's it, thank you. Okay, uh, interesting perspective. Larissa and Karin, uh, you had also uh, Yeah, I had a question for So Jung. Um, so I wanted to ask, how were you involved in the process of reflexive VR construction? Uh, were programming, modeling, coding part of your creative work in this project? Uh, how was this whole process? Oh, <laughs> you mean the each project or just only for the virtual exhibitions? You can talk about all of them, like oh, <laughs> your process. Sure. And all of them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for the question. And also thank Linda, thank you so much for your comments. Because for, you know, like as a practice-based researcher, like infrastructure, that technical limitation, like that is huge important, like huge, like so much important because that affects everything, to be honest. 
sometimes because as a like you know like artists or like you know, theorists we sometimes we discard how like infrastructure important how that actually you know can be on for that conceptual levels so like my practice-based research of course uh, there are three projects we're involved and each of them have like different levels of immersion and interactivity. So the in interesting part of my PhD is that I really focus on the restrictions of technology, not just on the potentials of technology, because I know like how limited, you know, the technology <laughs> we can use. So I just use that limitations of immersion as the way we can, you know, provokes the reflection. So it was kind of interesting way I could explore. And in terms of the virtual exhibitions, uh, because I'm not, not, I'm not a programmer, but I was in the IT department. So they were like, weird genius programmer was there. So the, the way we work is that I build the 3D environment. So which is that a lot of 3D models I already built for that the project. So it was pretty easier because I only had a, like six weeks because of the pandemic happened. So I, I didn't have a, any plan to build an online virtual museum even. So suddenly I had to curate it, the virtual museum. It was kind of crazy times, like six weeks and just $4,000. I had to just figure things all out during the pandemic. It was chaos. So I just brought the, all the like uh, 3D models and built things in Maya and sent to that engineer. But before uh, engineer work with that, um, I built that scene using a Unity and I kind of put the first person controller and kind of showing how it looks like when we navigate through. So basically I create a prototype using Maya and Unity and then show how it looks like and the engineer using 3JS, JavaScript, and WebGL and developed. But um, I really want to develop this one can work inside of the VR, VR and VR, and also kind of add a little bit of social interactions, but I couldn't <laughs> because of the technical limitation and the budget and time. But hope I can bring more fundings and also you know, like if we can have a chance to work together, it would be great. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for your question. Karin? Thanks. Um, I have a few comments about what Soyoung said and also about what Renee said. And uh, it might get a little messy because I have like a uh, 30 words scribbled around here. So bear with me, I'll try to organize it in my head as I speak. Um, the first thing about uh, comparing platforms, uh, this is one thing uh, Larissa, Daniel and I did while we were developing our work. And we were comparing the way uh, Occupy by Chihuahua works with how the two pavilions we studied from the wrong uh, works as an art exhibition. And one of the main differences between uh, both the pavilions we studied and Occupy Wedge Walls was the social interaction uh, factor, the, um, the whole uh, structure that Occupy Wedge Walls has for gamers to interact with each other, to visit uh, the other galleries, and even their um, their whole social network on Discord platform that it's, it's outside the game, but it's all related. And the, both uh, the pavilions we studied for, for this work, uh, both not, uh, not Land and My Mother Was a Computer, um, were very limited in terms of social interaction. Uh, they, uh, uh, my, not, my Mother Was Not a Computer had a uh, space for chat and they even allowed you to take screenshots of the game and uh, they gave you a random username for the chat room but it was very deserted it was very empty every time i logged in there was no one there and they were 
by the end of the exhibition, months after the run was over, uh, there were like two or three screenshots. So there were uh, social features, but they, were, but they were not really well used, I think. Um, if they didn't implement those features to their exhibition, it wouldn't make a difference. To my point of view, as a visitor, it wouldn't change a thing because it was not, um, it was not something that I was interested to build a conversation around in the long term. Like occupy by the, occupy by the walls, you have uh, you have more to talk about in terms of users get to interfere with what's being built and uh, featured in the game. In new assets, they can participate in the building of the game and the galleries. They have a more active participation in that sense. While visiting a pavilion in the wrong, you don't get to interfere with what's in there. You can only view the work and you don't really need uh, a chat room within the exhibition to direct, uh, to comment about that. You can do it in any other social network. So I think it's, it ends up being a little bit of an unnecessary feature, but some people do uh, like interacting with others while in exhibition. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, I think it wasn't well used in this case. Well, there's something in chat. Do I want to dedicate development funds and time to develop those features and test them? Or can I dedicate them to other aspects of my creation? Well, I think that depends on what you want your creation to end up being. Uh, if you want it to uh, be a community space, if you want people to build a community around that, then certainly uh, dedicating funds and time to develop social features is important. But if you don't, really want that if it's if it's not your objective to have a community around that then it's a waste of time and space and money uh, in my opinion of course as a as a person who visits exhibitions and not as someone who builds them uh, most of the time i don't even play occupy white walls that's with ladies and her gallery <laughs> I, I, I have no uh i have no physical disposition for that and that's when we enter another thing Renee said that is about uh, the accessibility to virtual exhibitions. Like uh, to people who are used to using a computer, it might be very easy to navigate using a mouse and the keyboard and to walk around the gallery. But for example, uh, the, both the pavilions we treat in our, in our work are very surrealistic. We can navigate them vertically, we can jump uh, ridiculous heights. And we are in general uh, in a space that could not exist in a real offline world. Uh, but there is also the thing that uh, while I'm more used to using a computer and I could access that sort of easily, uh, given an internet connection, I have trouble with simulator sickness. That's like motion sickness. So after 30 minutes, I really had to go to the bathroom because I was feeling very sick. So it's not something that works for everyone and it's not experienced the same way. So in general, even though I appreciated the works that especially in my mother was a computer uh, there were many many works uh Nathan was a lot uh a lot smaller in terms of different artworks it has like five artists four or five artists and each of them had one proposal while my mother was a computer had a lot more but i couldn't uh, while i did appreciate the ones i saw i couldn't stay long enough to see all of them because i wasn't feeling well after a while, because navigating online, especially vertically in a space that doesn't exist at all, uh, didn't <laughs> didn't work well with my brain. So uh, there is that. Like, there is the whole question of how available these exhibitions, how accessible they are for other for people in general, or for people who are not used to being in a computer or to navigating spaces online, and. Uh, that uh, kind of complements what Renee said about the differences in accessibility for things that are 
browser-based or software-based because even you having to download the game to access the exhibition, the game or the program ends up, it ends up being um, a little bit of a hassle for some people. Uh, if I had to, if my mother wanted to see an art exhibition and it depended on her accessing, uh, downloading in a program, she would have to ask for my help. If I couldn't help her, she would have to miss it. She wouldn't be able to access it. And also just to finish, so so you can can say she has a, her hand raised for a while. Uh, her arm must be tired from, <laughs> from holding her hand up. But uh, just to finish, uh, the whole access experience to exhibitions takes me back to Laura's work because of the question of avatar or no avatar. That's also a comparison we made between Occupy White Walls and both the platform, the platforms and the exhibitions uh, from the wrong we studied. Um, while Occupy White Walls has an avatar that can be personalized and can work as an identity, uh, both the pavilions we studied didn't have this feature. So we were navigating from a first person perspective, but we had no uh, body to make our own, to, to represent who we are. So we are seeing things from the first person perspective, but we uh, would not have hands, like we can't touch things. We only have a mouse and we will click on things and navigate, but uh, it makes me wonder how much can we really uh, assume the mouse is a hand in the virtual space? Like, does it work the same? Uh, because there's the whole interacting with art pieces thing. Uh, even online, we, there are some pieces that take clicking to be activated for things to happen, uh, but it doesn't work the same as in real life where you really have the whole uh, feeling what you're touching and even smelling. It's, it's very limited in terms of that. And then the avatar or no avatar question, the question of identity and or wearing a mask gets uh, gets back into the discussion because we have the whole thing like if I am there and seeing things from first person perspective it kind of creates the illusion that you have an identity within that space even though you have no body yourself but it's also very different from you having the possibility of uh, choosing how you look within that space of what mask you wear in a certain way so that's pretty much it. I'm sorry <laughs> I took so much time to say all that was in my just, head, but just just comment, like com short, short comments or like uh, maybe it could be question. I think we are kind of like neglect sort of the genres or styles of the artwork because I think, for example, in terms of social interaction features, like Manoni, I were <laughs> in a like closing reception in the gallery yesterday, everyone's come to the gallery for the social interaction and, you know, enjoying the foods, you know, like having a conversation with the people. But in terms of, for example, the VR pieces, it should be very immersive, it should be very quiet. So I think in terms of like the way we implement social, uh, because for example, like we, there are like someone's a volunteer or something, they facilitated a social interaction in front of the door like in the real world. And also we can kind of create a ritualistic environment, make people immerse. Like in the physical spaces, we have those kind of control. But I can see that a lot of sort of the virtual reality in metaverse, sort of those kind of feature is not really controlled. And also we kind of neglect a lot of uh, identities of the artwork, like th that should be very contemplative or that could be very social events. So I just kind of like maybe the questionings or like comments, they will be really interesting. We kind of see the narrow down the how like kind of like formats of the artwork and or identity or characteristic of, of the artwork, how the social interaction, social feature could be work in terms of the levels of appreciations or it could be screening, it could be virtual reality, it could be just painting or it could be like reception sort of like, you know, kind of event. I think that would be the application should be very different. So that's some things I just, my idea pops up through this panel. Yeah, thank you. Just to 
yeah, and also comment very briefly since our time is almost running out. We can, of course, extend it a little bit in case of well, the discussion seems to be very lively. But perhaps you comment also on Renee's question: uh, Why, why would you dedicate time for uh, for something or someone else or something else? Like maybe that's one of the reasons why people resort to platforms such as Occupy White Walls or New Art City because most of this is already there for you to use, and then you can just focus on. Uh, well, curating, but of course there there's biases implicit in the platforms and specific affordance that you have to negotiate with. And I think that your next question is even more interesting. Like, how many exhibitions actually form community? Like, you you simulate some sort of social interaction and you give people sometimes very interesting social possibilities. Like, I uh, I was I I kept remembering of a, a platform called Rec Room, which is a it's a VR environment for playing and, and you can mute specific people so that your experience of an environment is different from others people or the people in the same environment because you you can control who you are interacting with. But in any case, to actually build community that requires commitment and effort. And sometimes that's also what you're going after. You might be going after or doing something on Second Life because you want to talk to the furries and the, the, the people at Second Life. They, they've been there for a long time and they are very committed. And I was quite surprised to know that there is a uh, community, a community of people uh, working in Occupy White Walls, you know, because I look at it on the Facebook ads that I received, like, this, this looks so lame. But anyway, someone will always fall in love with, this, with these things, right? Uh, it it reminds me a little bit of The Sims or perhaps what people are doing with Animal Crossing as well. But I think that the, the, whole, the, the whole question of community and, and social interactions is, is really central, perhaps from my perspective. Also because Daniel commented on the idea that underlying all of this, there is still the white cube. So there is still this maybe uh, expectation that you can isolate art from the world. And I wonder if some of the questions that we are raising here, or maybe the social interactions or maybe something else can be some sort of escape vectors for us to understand that, or, or for us to experience the fact that the artwork the art work is never really isolated and there is a sort of very complex and ambiguous relation between our spheres of representation and like life at large or whatever, which was a very broad comment about lots of things that I've been hearing this very interesting conversation, but we can keep on talking more. Uh, we could perhaps keep, keep get back to the question with the great question that ends or reopens all conversations like, where are your projects going now? So if, if you could volunteer uh, us this information, Laura, Daniel, Larissa, Karin, and Sojang, what are the next steps for each of your projects? I can start with now because I mean, really want to collaborate at some point because I'm from South Korea originally, so I'm, uh, we are thinking of like applying for grants, sort of creating sort of metaverse spaces for exhibition archive, as well as performance, because I'm cross appointed to film and media, but also dance to music and drama. So my position is kind of connecting the film and media side of, and also performance side. Of. So I just wonder if we can create a, some sort of general international platform uh, we can exhibit things, but also we can interact and we can perform. So I just was, so I don't know, but if I'm still still trying to figure it out, if we have a general grammar, I can build it or I should, because if I just uh, build something for focusing on around that project itself, I have to just keep changing. But I wonder if I can sort of, um, if I can build sort of general, we can build some general platform that could be applicable for the general performance and, and art curation. So I'm still trying to kind of like figure it out like infrastructural things and also like developing the grammar. So like I'm, I'll be really want to keep, you know, keep in touch with you guys and learn all about your works and progress and everything. So please keep communicating. But I, I don't know, have I, I don't have any answer yet, but I really want to learn from you guys. Brazilians? Uh, I was waiting for, for Laura. Would you like to, to go first? 
Okay. <laughs> so um, as I was uh, uh, telling, we we have plans for uh, curating art exhibitions in uh, Occupy White Walls. This is a kind of uh, an experiment there. Um, and maybe Karine is going uh, to another route because uh, actually she is uh, researching on blockchain technologies. So um, for this uh, presentation, we, um, we had this uh, opportunity to, to see uh, and to inquire on uh, the wrong experiences uh, with uh, the pavilions, but uh, actually uh, her main focus uh, is on blockchain technology. So, but we are uh, also uh, thinking about uh, an exhibition dealing with this uh, theme, uh, not uh, only with um, like mining NFTs, but uh, talking about this. Uh, issue we have now uh, around um, uh, certification and so this sort of things. Maybe Larissa or Karine, would you like to, to compliment? Uh, yeah, I'd like to compliment uh, with something. I wanted to do a commentary about the how many exhibitions actually form a community, either online or offline. I don't think that's the job of an exhibition, but I feel like it's needed when it's a game, like Occupy White Walls presents itself as a game and considering a relationship to games and streamers nowadays, it really engages the community. And now for my project, I'm also working on the platform that they have uh, called Cultura. Uh, which is the database of the images of artworks that are in the game. And I'm also trying to um, have a, 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 quantify <laughs> a quantified research on, the, on how many Brazilian players there are, if the game is popular here in Brazil or not, and how many artworks uh, made by Brazilians are in the platform or that depict Brazilians. They have many, many, many artworks um, uh, made by the artists that came here from the French artistic mission. But then when you look for Brazilian artworks, uh, you just have Tarsila do Amaral and <laughs> this kind of other <laughs> issues. And I'm also trying to get um, more Brazilian artists to upload artworks in the platform of the game, because they have this feature, the players can add their images of artworks, which raises a lot of other issues <laughs> regarding the platform. So that's where I'm going now with the research. Thank you. And Laura? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, actually, uh, <laughs> developing the thread of identity and self uh, from now on I will be focusing on war and especially on empathy and subjects uh, of present and immersion and embodiment. Indeed, I was very impressed by uh, So Young's uh, presentation. And so uh, actually I'm working on how um, or research how you can embody yourself in other bodies from you know the starting point of the avatar as we said today and also going on what does it mean from a philosophical and also art critic perspective especially for what concerns all the post-human philosophy so yeah Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for all the presenters and all the participants for today. If you want to refresh your, your memory about the presentations, they are on YouTube, as will be this panel discussion in a couple of hours. And I hope to see you all next week for our final or la uh, one before last panel performing collections with Ashley Lenny, um, Hoyer Tse, 
and Stephanie Bertrand and Rosalind Bond who couldn't come today. So uh, that's it for today and have a nice Thursday. See you around. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It's a pleasure to participate and talk to you, Laura and Sujo.